Uh, welcome to the first ever fully online South Baton Rouge Church of Christ worship service. Uh, as many have stated during this time, uh, even though worship services have been canceled, the, the church isn't. The church is all over, and there are opportunities to worship God right where you are. And we're grateful that we have opportunities with our technology to be able to put something out and still connect as a body. So today we have several songs that we're going to lead, and we encourage you to sing in the comfort of your home. Then we're going to share communion, and I hope that you've prepared something to, uh, to take communion with those uh, in your living room. And we're not going to dismiss for kids' praise. However, we do have a children's program put together on a link below. I encourage you to go through that with your kids. Uh, and then we're going to have a sermon by Joe Tudor, and he has some neat things to share with us. So we're glad that you joined us, and let's praise God. We praise thee, O God, for the song of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, and glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, and glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Spirit. Now we're going to move into our communion time, and we know that we're spread throughout the city, and we're in our, our homes and our living rooms and crowded, crowded around computers uh, watching this service. And so I hope you've prepared some communion to take with your family. If not, I encourage you to pause and go get that ready and then come back and join us in a moment. In Luke chapter 22, and starting in verse 15, Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I'll not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. I've always been drawn to this phrase that Jesus says that he's, he eagerly desired to eat it with them. Uh, there's something in Jesus where he wanted to connect with his disciples, connect with his brothers one last time before he knew he was going to suffer and die. And so it continues and says, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not eat again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So he takes these two emblems, takes the bread and passes it around and says, this is my body. And the cup full of wine and says, drink this, this is my blood. And he invites them all at this one table to remember his one body. I had a friend years ago who shared this idea with me that when we were taking communion here in America, that we were joining a table where people had been celebrating Christ's death and resurrection throughout the world. And so right now, as as we take the Lord's Supper, uh, my friends in Italy were at this same table about eight hours ago. And our brothers and sisters in China were at this table 13 hours ago. And our brothers and sisters in the East Coast about an hour ago met and in similar ways remembered Jesus. And a little later today, my family in Arizona and family members and brothers and sisters that we have throughout California and Oregon and Washington will take the Lord's Supper in about two hours. We'll all be together at one table. And this is a table that that doesn't just transcend space. It's not just for this one day. It's a table that people who have been followers of Jesus have met to remember him at throughout time. And so we're at this table with those who have gone on before us. For friends and family, they're here with us at this table just like our brothers and sisters around the world are. So um, before we continue on, I I would like you to pause the video and share with those in the room with you, or if you're by yourself, just reflect for a moment on the people that are here at this table with you. They might be people who have lived before and have passed on. They might be people in other places in the world, but it might just be your brothers and sisters in our church who are in their own homes remembering Jesus right now. So let's pause and and remember them, share with your family members those names, um, and let's recognize that we're all at this table together. It's powerful to remember all of those. All those names are people that have claimed Jesus as their Lord, and they're people that Jesus loves very much. There's those names and more names than we can possibly name in any given morning. So as we take this, we're reminded that we all come together to remember Jesus and that he died for everyone. Let's pray. Father, as we take this bread, we remember Jesus had a body and he came into this world And he lived, and he suffered, and he died. And as we take this, we're reminded that he was just like us. And as we take it, we're reminded that we're bound with other followers of him. United as his family. And as we take this cup, we're reminded of Christ's blood, which poured out on the cross. We're reminded of of this blood that that is washes over us, cleanses us of sin, and marks us as yours. So as we come to this table with um, all of our brothers and sisters throughout the world and throughout history, we're all marked by this same blood as your children. Father, remind us in this time at your table that we're not alone that we're surrounded by people who love us and a great cloud of witnesses that have come on before. And in all of it, we praise you and we thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice. Amen. I hope you enjoy your time of communion with your family today.
Hey church, I know a lot is going on right now and in our community, and I hope that you are all well um, as we all as you all practice social distancing and quarantine. As we hope to do our part to keep this virus from spreading, and we are glad though that we can meet online and we can have worship together. It's a little different, but um, I hope you'll imagine that as a church we're we're connected in these moments uh, today. Uh, we're going to continue going through the book of Acts. I know we could talk about a lot of things, but I, I would like us to continue on our journey through the book of Acts. Uh, in Acts, we see a story of how the followers of Jesus took his message of life and death and resurrection of God's love for us, and they spread it throughout the world. And one of the key evangelists was Paul. And the Apostle Paul went throughout most of the known world telling people about Jesus. And during that time, Paul was not supported as a minister and living off of the donations of others, but Paul worked as a tent maker. And so we wanted to talk today about what does it mean to be a tent maker today? What does it mean to to share Jesus and be an evangelist and yet have jobs in banking and teaching and Uh, working for maybe the power company, I don't know, working for all kinds of different places, and yet still seeing yourself as a disciple and as evangelist for Jesus. So as I thought about this lesson, it, it seemed best to hear from someone who was already working in the secular world and wasn't employed by the church. And uh, the, for one of the first names that came to my mind was Joe Tudor. Uh, Joe's going to share with us today what it, what it means to be a tent maker and what we can learn 
um, from Paul's practice as working as a tent maker, making and selling tents, and yet traveling the world and making sure people knew about Jesus. So I want you to consider Joe's words in the midst of this season of quarantine and how you might be ministering and helping other people around you, right? How is it that God has placed you in this particular moment, in this particular time to be an evangelist, to be a minister to those around you? So let's hear what Joe has to say. When we think about Paul, we think about him as one of the greatest evangelists ever for the gospel. He wrote a lot of letters. Half of the New Testament is his writing. He made uh, at least four missionary journeys that we know about to visit churches, to spread the gospel. And that's what we think about when we think about Paul. But, but he also had a day job, you might say, being a missionary, being a preacher, an evangelist was not his vocation, apparently. In Acts 18, verses 1 through 4 says, After these things he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So this tells us that by trade he was a tent maker. And then on the Sabbath, he spent time in the synagogue evangelizing people. Uh, He spent time writing letters. But but he was a tent maker by trade. That was his vocation. So most of us are not professional ministers or evangelists. Most of us have secular jobs. But we've all been called to follow Jesus and to make disciples, to be evangelists in some kind of way. We probably all came to our jobs in different ways. Some of us fell into a good situation that turned into a nice career. Some of us actively pursued a passion and made it into a career. Some of us accidentally did that. Uh, Some of us used an existing talent to make a little money on the side, maybe, and it turned into something that turned into a business. Um, Some of us are still trying to find it. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up sometimes. But uh, even though maybe you didn't pursue your vocation as a way to reach out to people and spread the gospel, it turns out that no matter where you are or what you're doing, you do have an opportunity to shine the light of God into other people's lives. You, You can and you do have an influence on other people. It's not a choice about whether to have an influence, but it's a choice about what kind of influence that you will have on other people. The people that you work with, The people you spend time with, they know who you serve. They know whether you serve a God of money or power or recognition, self-promotion, or they know if you serve the God of service, the God of love, the God of righteousness and light. The people that you work with, the people you spend time with every day, they know who you serve. So I want to invite you to consider how you can serve God in your vocation, in your day job, at your workplace? How can you serve God? How can you shine the light of the gospel where you are? We'll talk about that a little bit. I clearly don't have all the answers about how to do that. I have some thoughts and ideas. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15 that he was the worst. He's the chief sinner. And I feel that way too. I I am certainly not uh, held up as the best example of a Christian in the workplace, as much as I try, but uh, sometimes I feel like I'm the worst, the worst example. I do have some ideas that might be helpful, some examples of things to avoid, some colossal failures that I have experienced in my effort to shine a light, to be a good witness, Um, some things that can damage your witness. I reached out to a few of my friends for their ideas as well, and I'll, I'll share some of those thoughts with you about how we can serve God in our vocation, shine the light in our workplace. First, you should know, you probably do know, but uh, it's a good reminder that having a secular job or a career is not a lesser calling than being a full-time minister. I, I had a time when I regretted that I did not choose ministry as a career because I thought I could reach more people and, and do greater things. 
But it turns out that uh, none of the apostles were full-time ministers, really. Jesus uh, did not choose the professionals to send out to go and make disciples. He chose regular people, and and some of them had uh, less than desirable vocations. He chose the fishermen, the tax collectors. It it even seems, you know, at a point that while Paul was a tent maker, he also seemed to be a professional hitman in a way. And so... Jesus didn't choose the professional ministers, the Levite priests, to go and spread his message. Paul also mentions a lot of other people that were with him, helping him and encouraging him, and he would send them out. And they probably had secular jobs too. They were probably tent makers or some other kind of job that they had. So we we don't see Jesus choosing the professionals to go and make disciples. Exodus 35 has uh, a a good description of the kind of people that God used for his purposes. In Exodus 35, verse 30, begins the, uh, is, is in the beginning of gathering people to build the, the tabernacle. In verse 30, Exodus 35, 30, Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all craftsmanship to make designs for working in gold and in silver and in bronze, in the cutting of stones for settings and in the carving of wood so as to perform in every inventive work. He has also put in his heart to teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and of an embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet material and in fine linen and of a weaver as performers of every work and makers of designs. And then in, in chapter 36, the first verse says, uh, Bezalel and Aholiab and every skillful person in whom the Lord has put skill and understanding to know how to perform all the work in the construction of the sanctuary shall perform in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. So he called the skilled craftsmen to come and build this tabernacle. He needed the skill of all of those people, the metal workers and the stone dressers and the woodworkers and engravers and weavers and designers and all of these people These were not the Levite priests. But they needed these people to get the work of God done. God needed these people to bring them together to build the tabernacle to accomplish His purpose. So He didn't use the priests to do everything. Matthew 5, in verse 13. Well, in Matthew 5, Jesus addresses a crowd of people. Not just His apostles, not just the chosen few people. 5.1, he saw the multitudes. He went up on the mountain. So there's a whole crowd of people there. And in verse 13, he tells all of these people that you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So he tells all of these people, that they are the salt and the light. We're the messengers taking his word into the world, into our workplaces, to shine his light and show people the goodness of his love. We are the salt and light of the world. I was driving through Natchez last week. I saw a church sign that says, be salt and light, not salty and lit. The people you work with, they know. They know whether you are salt or salty. You don't have to go advertise. You don't have to tell them. They know which one you are. And here's how I know that they know. One of my failures, I was in a meeting at work a few years ago, about 20, 25 people in the room. Topic got onto something that got me a little bit angry, got me excited. And I stood up to make a forceful comment, and I used a word that everybody else uses all the time, constantly. A word that we can't repeat here, I don't want to repeat. But I used that word pretty loud and pretty forcefully. And as soon as I did, the room got quiet. And people turned to look at me. 
And I heard a guy over to the side say, I didn't know he knew that word. And I knew two things right away. As soon as that happened, as soon as I heard that comment, I knew two things. I knew that they had seen me and how I normally act and how I carry myself and conduct my business. They had seen my witness and they knew who I served. And I also knew at that moment that I just tore it all down. And I had to start rebuilding and I had to start working on it all over again from the beginning, maybe even from before the beginning because I just tore it down. Most of us struggle in some way with our words and the language that we use. James 3.8 reminds us that the tongue is a restless evil. It's full of poison. It cannot be tamed. We, we know that. We know it's a, a struggle. One of the people that I reached out to also admitted to struggling with language. And he reminded me that making a point to apologize for our behavior can be as Christ-like as modeling his characteristics and living a holy life. Make it a point. When, when those things happen, when you fail, let people know that you recognize that and apologize for it. And he also said that spiritual maturity is often equated with projecting a more perfect image. But it's not something we see modeled in Scripture. So we, we think if we can be perfect and, and project this perfect image, then that will be our spiritual maturity. But we know we're not perfect, and we know we're not going to get there. And, and, we, and Scripture tells us that we aren't perfect. This is why we need a Savior. Romans 7, Paul describes this struggle that we have. I think it's a familiar description. Romans 7, verse 21. He says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. We know this struggle is happening constantly and we know this is why we need a Savior. Jesus is on our side. We should also recognize that our coworkers know that we're not perfect. They will see our failures. They'll know and if we hold ourselves up as perfect people, as the perfect examples, they'll know we're not genuine. Think about somebody that you know in the workplace. You probably have somebody, they've got a, a scripture on their email signature they talk about church, they talk about the service that they do and all of the great things they're involved in. And maybe they wear the jewelry, they have all the outward signs of Christianity. But they also participate in all the gossip and the rumor mongering and the inappropriate jokes. And all the people around them know. They know who they serve. Our co-workers, the people around us, they know who we serve. Blaine reminded us last week that our testimony is on display. Whether you like it or not, whether you intentionally put it out there, our testimony is on display. In Acts chapter 4, the rulers recognized Peter and John as having been with Christ. They saw them, I don't know if it was because of something they said, the way they acted, but they recognized that these people have spent time with Jesus. And the people that we spend time with, they also know if we've spent time with Jesus. They see how we act, they see how we talk. They understand. One of the people I reached out to said that he worked with a guy one time when they had uh, a little slack time in work. This guy was always reading his Bible. He didn't actively preach to people. He didn't actively evangelize, but he was always reading his Bible. And that had an impact on the way he acted. And, and this person said that years later, that action by that guy planted a seed for him and influenced the way he acts now and the things that he does in his Christian walk. Even if you're not actively evangelizing people, they know who you serve. And even if you have a job that seems invisible to other people, and you think nobody notices me, they wouldn't even notice if I weren't here, if I were gone. And in some cases, some jobs, that might happen, but people still know who you are. Even if they don't know the work that you do, they know who you are. Um, think about what would happen if that job were done by somebody that was always grumpy and angry and upset. People know. They recognize who it is. 
They would take notice. They also notice how you treat other people. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that we are an ambassador, a representative for Christ. Second Corinthians 5.20 Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled for God. An ambassador is a person who acts as a representative or a promoter for someone else. And we've been sent out to be ambassadors for Christ. So we haven't all been called to be full-time ministers. We haven't been given the means or the training whatever that takes to be the full-time minister, but we have been given skills that the world needs in other ways. Other things, you know, the, all the, the stone dressers and the woodworkers and the weavers were all needed to make the tabernacle. They needed the priests then to go and perform the, the rituals that they did, but they needed all these other skills to build the tabernacle. And so we've been given skills that the world needs. And while we are not full-time ministers, we have been called to go and make disciples. So as we go about our job, we're reminded in Colossians 3 who we serve. Colossians 3, 22. If we read that today, uh, it seems a little distant because it's addressed to slaves, but if we translated that to a 21st century translation, it might sound something like this. Workers, obey your supervisors, your foremen, your managers, and everything you do. And do it not only when they're micromanaging and breathing down your neck, but do it with sincerity of heart and honor for the Lord. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Like I said earlier, I don't have all the answers for how to get through the workday, how to be a stellar example of a Christian in the workplace. I have a few thoughts, ideas, some things that other people shared with me that might be helpful. First, pray in everything you do, always. I think that it's the best idea ever to pray first thing in the morning. Get up a little early before the world starts making noise, starts moving in on you. Maybe you have to set your alarm a few minutes early, 10 minutes. That's not much. Get up early, pray. Jesus got up early and went to a quiet place to pray alone. Why shouldn't we do that? You can pray in your car on the way to work while you're fighting traffic and all these aggravating people are moving in on you while people are honking at you and all this noise has happened. You can pray at your workstation when people are coming by and doing whatever they do. But if you start the day with a prayer before anything else takes your attention, it can really set the tone for your day and make it go a lot better and make it a lot easier to set that example when you're in the workplace. In Philippians chapter 2, While you're working for the Lord, as we read in Colossians 3, you should be doing that without grumbling or complaining. Philippians 2, verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. We could see our workplace as these crooked and perverse generation, and we're to be a light, and the best way to do that is to avoid that culture of grumbling. Even in a workplace for a company where it's all good, some of us have places that we are blessed with really good jobs and good benefits, and people still grumble. No matter how good it is, no matter how great things are, we work for a nice boss, but there's still all kind of grumbling. Somebody called it micro-complaining, but we can avoid that. Walk away from those conversations, change the subject, do something, but don't get caught up in the grumbling that goes on. And even if you, you have a terrible workplace and people are grumbling about it, find something else to talk about or walk away from those conversations. Just don't be part of the grumbling. Um, You can actively pursue more positive inputs. There's a lot of negative inputs that we get, and we can't control all of those, but we can look for more positive things. You can subscribe to push notifications on your phone and get little Bible verses that pop up and remind you to read this verse. 
or you can create reminders to go off to a quiet place and pray in the middle of the day. You can subscribe to newsletters that come to your inbox that give you some encouraging words. You can use a day planner that's got Bible verses, encouraging quotes on each page. And you can spend more time with the people that act like you aspire to be. We read in Acts 18 that Paul went to Corinth and he found Aquila and Priscilla because they were tent makers. I don't know, maybe all the tent makers there all gathered in one place and that's where they all went. But he didn't just go find tent makers. He found Christians to spend time with, to lift him up and encourage him. As great an evangelist as he was, he still had people around him that encouraged and lifted him up. And so we need to go find people that do that for us as well and spend more time with them. So a lot of people have damaged our trust in others But we have to actively work to trust people, to believe in them, guide them and help them when we can, pray with people if you see they're having a difficult time, lift them up. Trusting people and believing them might be one of the hardest things we can do, but when we do that, they see our witness and they recognize who we serve. We should be actively looking to find and recognize our own biases, our own conscious and unconscious biases, and changing those to more positive things because even if they're unconscious, they affect how we treat people. And, and that affects how people see us and that affects our witness. Try to find those things and work on them. I've mentioned that I'm not perfect recognizing, admitting, and letting other people know that you're not perfect, um, that you don't have all the answers, and sometimes that your answers are wrong. I've had to do that publicly a few times, send out a a notice to a few thousand people, and within 30 seconds, somebody tells me what was wrong with it, then I have to go and tell everybody, that was wrong, let me restate it, I'm sorry, I have to say I was wrong. I know a guy who cannot use the words, I don't know. Being able to say I don't know is important. Maybe you follow that up with, I'll go find out, but it's important to recognize I, I don't have everything I'll do my best. And when I'm wrong, I try to admit it. James 1 reminds us that difficulties will come our way. And how do people see us act when times are hard, when things are stressful? Do we fall apart? Do we blow up? Do we explode? Or do we calmly address this and work through it? In the King James Version, Proverbs 29 and 18 says that where there is no vision, the people perish. That is a really important thing to do, is to have a vision of who you want to be. How do you want to project project the gospel and the light in your workplace and write it down? Write down your vision. Write down some actions that you can take to make it happen. So we do this with our workplace all the time. We have visions at work and we have goals for what we want to get done this year to accomplish that vision Write down your vision for how you want to be an evangelist in the workplace. How do you want to go and make disciples or influence the people around you for God? And write down some actions that you can take to make that happen, including prayer. And remember that your testimony is on display. People are watching. Hebrews 13 Hebrews 13 and 20 says, basically, a blessing for us on this mission. Now, the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. May the God of peace equip you in every good thing to do his will. And that's my prayer for you, that God would equip you for this mission and your calling to be salt and light in your workplace. I'd like to end with a prayer. Our Father, we bow before you and lift up your holy and precious name, the name above all other names. We offer to you our praise, and we ask that you continue to watch over us, protect us, and lift us up as we go out to our workplaces, as we go out to all the places where we interact with others, that you would help us to remember 
that we are salt and light to the community. And pray that that light would shine brightly, that we people would be influenced positively for your word by our actions, and that you would continue to give us the strength and the remembrance that you're on our side, that you're serving us, that you are lifting us up as we carry about your mission. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us in worship today, and we thank you, Joe Tudor, for the message that you shared. Uh, one of the benefits of this setting is that you can finish at the end of this video and discuss what you learned with your family and insights that you have had. I want to draw your attention to two different links below. Uh, one is for giving. There's a link for online giving. If you are able, we encourage you to, to fill out that form and donate through that link. And the second is uh, for prayers. If you would like us to pray for you, fill out a form and it will send those prayer requests to the church office and they'll be distributed to the staff and to the elders. We encourage everyone to reach out to your brothers and sisters in this church and see how they're doing as we're isolated and quarantined. Uh, it doesn't stop us from being able to call or to text. So I encourage you to reach out to people that, that you know or maybe that you don't know very well and see how they're doing. Uh, we want you to know that we are, we are praying for you. And we're praying for this church, and we uh, can't wait till we get through this together and we're all back in one place. Next week, I'm going to be sharing with you a message from Acts 19 about Paul's experience in Ephesus, and I hope you'll join us then. Um, but until that day, God bless each one of you.